coming to the tech talk part. <laughs> there are two logos on the slides. So these are companies actively building production machine learning pipelines using VV8. This is also a nice little showcase, but in the end, if you're building this little demo application, because sometimes for us it's just showcasing what our tech stack is capable of doing, but in the end, you always need to think about how to scale these, what to do if you want to bring this into production, because this is just a little demo showcase, showcasing hybrid search and um, traditional or utilizing text search and vector search. Victoria is going to give you a deep dive um, for hybrid search. My part here, or my take about this application, which is a streamlit application, is when you build your prototype, your scenario where you're just testing a thing, if this is becoming a production machine learning pipeline, you need to think about several things. You need to think about how to scale these. Um, I want to quote Etienne. So Etienne is always saying, VV8 scales infinity as long as nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's true. But in the end, this is one of the core values for VV8 that you can shift in workload of vector embeddings of billions and scale, scale these uh, horizontal and build production-ready machine learning applications to serve your, whatever you have built to thousands or millions of users. Horizontal scaling and um, deployment of this application, it's not an easy task. It's super, most of the time, it's super boring friction, super boring infrastructure. I mean, I was building infrastructure for over 10 years in data science machine learning. Um, so it's quite useful to have a tool which is getting away your friction and taking care that this stuff is just scaling without taking care about this infrastructure stuff. Then also one of the more enterprise-ready features we are very proud of is multi-tenancy. Uh, multi-tenancy means data isolation. So you can run on the same infrastructure for multiple users, for multiple clients um, in the same application but with data isolation. So it makes also your life easier for production-ready um, AI applications which you want to scale into the billions. As it's open source, these slides are linked, so there is a GitHub repository with a notebook where you can easily dig into multi-tenancy and play around. Super easy. Now I'm going to talk about retrieval augmentation generation pipelines. Anybody here in the room aware of what this technique is doing or somebody needs an exp Yes? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so but I'm giving you a short, uh, a short introduction because uh, Edward is later on showing a Verber or a REC retrieval augmentation generation tool, which is also open source and you can use it uh, to your own. So, REC means you have an internal knowledge base or internal company information or whatever it is, and the large language model has never seen this data, but you want that the large language model is generating you an output which is using this internal knowledge. Because there can be a knowledge gap, it can be out of domain, it can be stuff. I mean, these large language models are trained on these large corpus of the internet, Reddit, and all these shady data. OpenAI would never ever <laughs> give you an insight. But it's all thrown in, but your internal company information is not part of it. So, but you want that the you're building a chatbot or whatever application it is, and you want that the large language model is generating specific output. So you have in these retrieval augmentation generation pipelines the retrieval part, and VV8 is using hybrid search out of the box. Victoria is giving you a deep dive. And the user is asking a specific question, which you just, it's only possible for the large language model to answer this um, using this information. So there's this information retrieval. You search through it, hybrid search, and then putting the chunks it's finding um, into the context window of the large language model, generating the specific output for the user. It could be also output uh, you have not in the retrieval. But Edward is showcasing later on more deep dive through it, and I do not want to explore. explore okay, I should move on. <laughs> ah, wait a second. We're going to the notebook. <laughs> 
We have also an open source uh, Jupyter notebook um, with the retrieval augmentation generation pipeline. Um, but I heard I need to move on to yeah. be fast. Yeah. Want to skip this? Okay, we're skipping these. You can, it's in the slides, you can download it. It's just showcasing what retrieval augmentation generation pipeline is doing. Um, one of the advanced techniques um, to um, improve a retrieval augmentation generation pipeline, a lot of these chunking tricks, they are part of Verber. Edward is showcasing, also hybrid search, Victoria is doing this. But training your own model, it's one technique. Um, you train a model to generate GraphQL queries, which are including also filter settings. So you train a large language model for your API with this gen generating uh, the right query to fetch the information and we have a live showcase. So this is one of our short little demos, but in the end, um, I'm going to query these um, first. So this is health search. This is a rebuild of a pharmaco pipeline. In this case, we replace the pharmaco data because it's a bit abstract with a data set of iHerb. I, I wrote a scraper for this, I don't know, four years ago. It's uh, anyway, the scraper is old, but the project is new. Um, these are supplement reviews, and there's an overlap between patient notes or medical information because we have adverts, positive or adverts uh, drugs effects, so stuff which is helping me. So a patient has a condition or a disease and something is helping him, so pharmaco treatment. In this case, we are talking about supplements, so I can query what could help me, what help for sleep because I'm always jet-lagged since I'm working for VVH. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm adding, Thorn is a pretty good supplement brand, but I'm not advertising it. I just want that these queries generated. Now we're handing this over to a large language model and the GraphQL query for this is generated. And if it's not working, it's not us, it's OpenAI. <laughs> 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 try it, try it, cash me. Okay. Let me try it. <laughs> yeah, but it's working. Just give it a. Work one. We got a question over there. Yes? Yeah. Can you just mention where the QI is generated on the fly? Um, from the model, yes. So, and if the query is semantic related and we are generating the same, then it's cached in VV8. But in this case, now it's generated here. We have the GraphQL, including filter settings, which gives you a lot of opportunity to build advanced machine learning pipelines and also saving a lot of um, processing time in this case. Mm, okay. So. I would say, thank you. Um, if we are not connected, I am later on here happily connecting. And now I want to hand over to Victoria. Woo. 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 And if you have questions around retrieval augmentation generation pipelines, because um, they forced me to reduce my slides, <laughs> I can tell you a lot about chunking tricks, how to optimize these, using context, adding the dialogue, using semantic caching, whatever. So I'm here answering your questions. Hi everyone, um, I'm Victoria, as Philip mentioned, and Today I'm going to be talking about hybrid search, uh, which I think has become a bit of a buzzword, um, but I'm going to be taking a slightly different approach to the normal hybrid search talks that I've been seeing around. Um, so a lot of talks about hybrid search go into kind of the how-to of using hybrid search, and I'm not going to talk about that today, not that I don't think it's important or interesting, but just because it's super easy to do with Weaviate. Um, in Weaviate you just change this uh, little 
thing here. It's either hybrid vector or keyword search. And um, well, if my talk was just about implementing that change, you can do it yourself. <laughs> so um, instead, we're going to spend most of my time here talking about the how of hybrid search, uh, kind of what's going on behind that one line change in Weave 8, um, how it works behind the scenes. Um, and how complicated it is for such a simple implementation user side. Um, we'll also spend a little time talking about the why of hybrid search. So why is it important? Why has we v 8 a vector database, spent so much effort in really implementing a keyword search solution? And why this has really set us apart in the current fields. Um, and we'll end with a few whens, when you might want to use hybrid search, when you might not want to use hybrid search, and a specific use case. Okay. So. Hybrid search is most often the combination of vector search and keyword search. Um, implementing hybrid search really has everything that's hard with vector search plus everything that's hard with keyword search. And then you have to combine those two systems with a fusion algorithm. Um, so not the easiest topic, but we're going to break it down, um, starting with the vector search. So because we're a vector database, we obviously provide vector search. Uh, for vector search to happen, you need all of your documents, uh, which is everything in your database, and your query, um, which is the thing the user gives you to search for. And um, we turn these into vectors, which encode the meaning of these two things um, through this string of numbers format. Very simplified explanation, but we're going to roll with it. <laughs> um, when we talk about actually searching through these vectors, we first have to dive into this thing called ANN algorithms. So ANN stands for Approximate Nearest Neighbor, and it's used in vector search because it's a lot faster than going through every vector individually to try to want, find the ones that are closest to the query in this kind of abstract vector space. Um, the brute force algorithm is called KNN, and it doesn't scale, like, at all. <laughs> um, so when I say nearest neighbor, I'm talking about the closest vectors to the query vector. Um, the closest vectors are the most relevant. So when you search for um, whatever's closest to the query, you're searching for whatever uh, documents are most relevant to the query. Um, and ANN is approximate because it's not exact. Uh, the algorithm does some stuff to make it faster. And this means you can't guarantee gar getting the exact nearest neighbors from this algorithm. But it is really good, and it's fast, which is the main point. So there's a ton of options out there for uh, ANN algorithms, but I don't really have enough time to go into all of them. Um, so we'll go into VVH choice, which is HNSW. And I hate saying this, um, but it stands for Hierarchical, hierarchical <laughs> Navigable Small Worlds. I don't know why the word is so hard for me. Um, but basically, HNSW organizes vectors into this hierarchical, multi-layered graph structure which helps quickly search through these vectors during search operations. So when the graph is being constructed, that's a little video here, it takes all the vectors on the bottom layer, which is the layer 0, and then each layer above takes a smaller subsection of the vectors below while maintaining this connected graph structure throughout. So the longest distances between the vector end up being at the top and the shortest at the bottom. And um, this is kind of why it's called the small world, because having these limited connections between layers and in layers uh, maintains this efficient searching structure. OK, so when a query comes in, the algorithm starts at the top layer and finds the closest vectors on that layer to the query. It then takes those vectors, brings them down, expands the relevant vectors in the graph structure and uh, memory, and searches through them again, finds the nearest neighbor, brings it down until you get to the bottom. Um, so you're kind of jumping through vectors in this multi-dimensional space to get there. <laughs> this microphone is a bit annoying. OK. Um, so HSW has a lot of benefits, and it's a pretty popular solution out there in the vector database world, I would say. Um, it scales really well because it's super efficient memory-wise because it's only calling the relevant vectors into memory. Um, and it's also fast because of this um, multi-layered hierarchical structure. Um, which is different than like a flat index where you're really searching through one dimensional space. Um, there's a bit of a myth that HNSW only works for static data sets, and it doesn't work well when you're doing frequent updates or deletes, because anytime you up or delete something or update something, you really have to rebuild the entire index, so the entire graph structure from the ground up. Um, lucky for Weavate, we have implemented a custom implementation of HNSW. <laughs> within our vector database. 
um, for exactly this reason. So we're not limited by the limitations of external libraries because we made it custom, which allowed Etienne to come up with this genius solution to handle updates and deletes. So myth busted. Um, <laughs> so at the same time that vector search is happening, keyword search is also doing its thing in the background uh, for hybrid search. So to, in order to efficiently perform keyword search, you need to efficiently search for keywords um, across documents. So the inverted index is kind of our non-vector driven secret um, to allow us to offer things like hybrid search or filtering on the property level. So in Weave 8, each property gets its own inverted index. Um, in an inverted index, instead of storing documents with a bunch of words in them, you store the words with a document pointer. So this allows us to really quickly search for all the documents in which a word occurs, um, which is really nice. And for the actual search algorithm, we use BM25. Um, so BM25 takes into account three different things. Term frequency, which is how often a word appears in a document. Inverse document frequency, which is how important the word is um, by measuring how many documents it occurs in. And then document length, so it penalizes long documents. So when a query is ingested into Weave 8, we tokenize the query. Um, and then we basically calculate the BM25 score for the query's keywords based on all the documents. OK. So now we have a list of documents from vector search. And we have a list of documents from keyword search. But we need a way to combine these two scores from the two different algorithms to make sense of them. So we offer two solutions in Weave 8 to do this. The first is ranked fusion, which kind of um, uh, gives a score based on what rank it occurs in, not by the original score returned by the uh, algorithm. So you can see here, A is in position 1, so it gets 1 over 1. And in vector, it's in position 3, so it gets 1 over 3. And the final score ends up being 1.3. Our other option is relative score fusion. Um, so you can see here, these are kind of the original scores returned, and you would be able to combine these because you can't really combine two different um, scoreboards. Um, so what we do is we normalize these two vectors, and we turn the top one into zero, or top one into one, and bottom into zero, um, and then we can just add them together. Um, okay, so fusion algorithm remakes the documents, cuts off all the excess, and ta-da, you have all the most relevant documents from keyword and vector search. Um, but why? Uh, for the vector people out there, why add keyword? And for your keyword people, why add vector? <laughs> and to talk about that, we first have to talk about some of the benefits and drawbacks of both systems. So I'll start with vector search. Um, vector models are really great at capturing the meaning behind queries and documents, returning related results without needing to have the exact right keywords in the query and also dealing with queries in natural language, and even works really well with typos. However, they can struggle when working with out-of-context domains, in other words, domains that they were not trained on. Um, short queries are hard, and specific term matches for things like product names, industry jargon, not so good. So, keyword search is really robust across domains, um, because it's just searching for exact matches between the query and the document. Uh, it also handles short queries really well, and jargon and rare words, totally okay. However, it can miss out on relevant document results because they may not use the perfect words in the search query, or have typos, or when dealing with general terms in a very natural language format. So, hybrid search really allows the benefits of both systems to shine through without many of the drawbacks. Um, the system can handle natural language, synonyms, typos, and all the other benefits of vector search. But it can also specifically search for specific things like short queries and out of context terms. So when one system fails, the other is kind of there to catch it. So with all this, when would you actually want to use hybrid search? Um, you could see it as kind of an accuracy or performance trade off. So if you have a super specific model trained exactly on your data, chances are that vector search is probably good enough and you don't need keyword search. On the other hand, if you have usage patterns that rely a lot on keyword matching, like copy and pasted descriptions, rare words that match exactly, keyword-based search is probably enough. Um, if either of those is not good enough, hybrid search can probably give you the best of both worlds. 
Um, the cost is that you're doing two searches for every one user-initiated search, so you're basically cutting your possible throughput in half, but it can definitely better give you better accuracy. Okay, so I want to end by talking about my favorite use case for hybrid search, um, because I owe this website a lot for jumpstarting my career into programming back when I was looking up how to combine two strings in Python. <laughs> um, so Stack Overflow is an example of a use case where the goal, the end result, is search. Um, so keyword search is what they've been using in the past, and it works really well in a lot of cases, um, but it can only filter the documents if they have the exact right words in the query. Um, so this works really well for Stack Overflow mostly because there's a lot of very specific jargon, um, and sometimes you really want that specific phrase match in your response. However, um, it can miss some related results because sometimes you don't know the perfect words and then you're sitting there trying to figure out how <laughs> to combine two strings of Python for two hours. <laughs> Um, but um, if they just provided semantic search, obviously maybe not the best decision because you may want those specific phrase matches. So with the best of both worlds, they've been talking about maybe implementing a hybrid search solution and this could give them kind of the keyword functionality while still implementing some of the semantic search benefits. Okay, and this is a quote from their uh, blog post. So to get good results, you shouldn't need to know any magic words. Thank you all. Hello, hello. Okay, sorry everyone, we're already over time. But please, uh, it's okay. please give me five minutes <laughs> to show you some cool stuff. Uh, okay, while my laptop is... <coughs> just take your time. <laughs> yeah, so while this is uh, going, I can introduce myself. So hello everyone, my name is Edward. I'm a machine learning engineer in Philips team. And we now heard a lot of cool, exciting stuff, very cool tricks, tips, and theoretical. And now I'm going to use the remaining time to kind of make it more tangible. And what I want to show you now is our demo verba, which kind of combines um, hybrid search and all the rack stuff that Philip talked about. And again, what like for people that don't know what rack is. It means retrieval augmented generation, which sounds even more terrible. But it's basically you have a query and you use a search algorithm to get stuff back. And you give this stuff to your LLM to generate a response based on your query. And to make this more like tangible again, we have a live demo on verba.vdia.io. And the cool thing about this instance is that we have ingested all our VVA documentation, blog posts, and video transcripts into this instance, basically making this chatbot on steroids for VVA, being able to answer any VVA related question. And it's free to use, you can check it out, but down on mobile, please, because it's not optimized on mobile. So we can ask something like, what is VVA? So no, I'm lucky it works. <laughs> it doesn't wait. <laughs> Playback. Okay, perfect. Okay, now we got a uh, response based on our question. It is now cached because someone asked this question already, uh, which was probably me. And you now see stuff popping up. So on the top we have our chunks, which are related uh, based on our query using hybrid search. These numbers represent the ranking score that um, Victoria just <clears throat> talked about. You can also see that they're not sorted, and that's because I didn't sort them. That's something I need to do. Um, but yeah, you can click through them, you can see which is documentation, which is from a blog, and then you, you can also see the extract within that particular document, which makes like, <clears throat> which can reduce hallucination, which is a big problem of large language models. And it also allows you to use these LLM capabilities on your own domain data. And another cool extra is you can <clears throat> you can click on those blocks and then you can go to the original stuff. So it's a pretty cool support bot. 
and yeah. So this is everything what you see is open source. We have a uh, GitHub repository. You can uh, fork it, download it, and easily install it via pip install. We have already 1,400 stars. A lot of issues. So if you <laughs> <laughs> so if you're an open source contributor, please help me. Uh, I need help. Um, yeah, let's just skip the deployment stuff and just go to the local host, which I already have. So this runs locally. And another cool thing about Verba is that it's pretty modular. So we, we're integrating like um, famous or no uh, beloved libraries like Haystack, uh, Lama Index, um, Hugging Face, making this tool pretty, pretty awesome to customize. So for example, if we want to add documents now, we can choose what reader we want to have. Do we have PDF data? Do we have text data? Do we want something from GitHub? What kind of chunking technique do we want to use? Or what kind of embedding do we want to use? Mini LM uh, sentence transformers allowing you to embed stuff locally. So you don't have to send your data somewhere. You can do it all locally. You can also choose a different retriever and also Llama 2 model, which can also run locally. So you can <clears throat> basically run Verba completely locally on your computer, making it amazing and super secure. And let's just add some documents. And yeah, before, before I add documents, Philip, my, uh, my boss always says that we, if we have a showcase, we really need to have some like business value, a really nice example, a real business use case. And that's why I'm gonna insert a Minecraft guide so, who from the audience knows Minecraft? Hands up. Who, who still plays Minecraft? See? That's a real business use case. <laughs> so we put this in because it's a PDF. We're using the PyPDF <coughs> library data, which is locally. Everything happy. No API yet. If we're lucky, it works. So let me look here. So there's some stuff happening, which is good. Ooh, yeah. So it's a black screen and something is moving. This is good. Yay, okay. Now we have the stuff inside. We can look here in the Minecraft guide. It's all here. And then we can ask questions about Minecraft. So for example, what is Minecraft? So now we get the um, different chunks which are related to the question. We got a streaming token from GPT-4, which answers that stuff. So it's an open-ended video game. Sounds about right. And the cool thing is you can, it was super easy to import like Minecraft data, but you can use your own domain data. And because we're running out of time, um, this was pretty lightweight. And if you want to know more, um, next week there is a interview. I'm being interviewed, and I have the chance to talk about Verba more deeply from Streamlit. Somebody knows Streamlit. Uh, otherwise, you have this this guy, who looks like me, explaining stuff on YouTube, also about Verba. So it goes more into the uh, depths. And instead of Minecraft, I'm using a bachelor thesis as example data. And if you like reading, we have Medium blog posts uh, writing about Verba, which also go very deep into the code base, which is pretty cool. Um, we have actually more, and. Yeah, and otherwise you can ask me after the presentation. All right, thank you very much. That was everything. Oh, what? <laughs> oh, next speaker. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you can also already do the intro. All right. Um, yeah, I already start with a quick introduction while the screen loads. Uh, my name is Roma. I'm from uh, Fondal. It's a new open source tool which I'll be presenting. 
Um, we have a very nice logo, which hopefully will soon end up on the slide. Um, I'm the tech lead of Fonda. We don't have a developer growth team yet, so I have to do these talks myself. Um, and next to that, I uh, yeah, also am the tech lead of Connection. It's a Python API framework. I don't know if anyone here uses it. It has uh, over 5 million downloads a month, so uh, it's, uh, I hope someone here knows it. Um, and a principal engineer at ML6, one of the co-hosts of this meetup and the first investor, let's say, in Fonda. And for the next part, I uh, you need, need slides. My slides yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait a second. Yeah, I just tested it before, and uh, it took a while, but it worked. Okay, then we need to wait. <laughs> yeah, but uh, maybe I already explain a bit more. So the uh, title of the talk is how to speed up rec evaluation with Fonda. Um, so that's one of the sample use cases that we built. Um, but we're actually not a REC framework. We're a data processing framework, um, and our big goal is to make data processing reusable. So if you look at the machine learning community, we see a lot of sharing and reuse of models. Uh, like hugging phases is probably the prime example there. But everyone... I would share it to my Gmail. Yeah, but I have a, I have a live demo as well. Oh, okay. But it, wait, let me check. It, Turn green. Oh. Yeah, but or you just wait. Maybe you can the output. Just there. Okay, one fallback scenario is there's some hardy video. Alright, that can. Oh, oh, oh it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Oh, yeah, I just needed to show off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, this doesn't count against my time, right? Because it's very. Uh... <laughs> Alright, so I already mentioned this. Um, this as well, so again, everyone is uh, sharing models, but building data pipelines from scratch, uh, that's what we want to uh, solve, so we want to be the hub for data processing. Uh, this means that we have two parts, we have a framework and a hub, um, and I'll first yeah, introduce a framework, and I'll, then I'll go into the rack showcase later. Um, so what the framework lets you do, is it lets you build composable pipelines of reusable components. Uh, so one thing, by the way, enabling this is all the advancements in machine learning. We can do a lot more data processing with machine learning now, which also makes it more reusable. We're processing a lot of uh, unstructured data with uh, yeah, machine learning techniques. It's a lot different than data processing was a couple of years ago, where it was more custom uh, and you could not build as generalized uh, methods. But so there's a couple of things uh, we did in our design to enable this. So first of all, like each component um, has a data set in between. It's the interface between components, and this helps us to decouple them. Every component just describes like which data set can I work with, and then we can see like can you actually compose them uh, or put them after each other. Um, and it's yeah, quite uh, uh, easy then to, to put them together into a pipeline. The components themselves are designed for usability, and Fonda takes care of all the heavy lifting. So I'll go into those points uh, one by one. So first of all, the data sets as the interface. So what is actually happening every time you process your data? The data is written to blob storage. So think about uh, Amazon S3, about Google Cloud Storage. Um, and this has advantages, um, which we'll see, but also uh, yeah, it, it sounds like a lot of I.O. So we do some smart stuff there. First of all, we only store the diffs between the data set. Um, and we also limit the I.O. So every component defines like this is the data I need to use, this is the data I produce. We only uh, load those specific columns from the data. We track an index separately, so we only uh, read the necessary rows. So we do everything we can to optimize the, the I.O. needed. And what we get in return is that we have, uh, again, that composability, but also full lineage. So we have a um, we can build a version of the data between each component. I'll show this later interactively as well. And this allows us to inspect data, uh, see like what is each step doing, 
but also use pipeline caching. It's very easy to resume a run, uh, make some changes, and not have to run everything again because we know what we start from. Second one is components are designed for usability. Um, so everything is packaged in a Docker container. Uh, we already made this as easy as possible, but this is an ongoing effort. Like uh, soon you will not have to touch Docker yourself for uh, uh, simple components, for more complex, with complex dependencies, uh, you might have to. Um, but yeah, we, might to, we try to make it as easy as possible. And it defines a contract that is both human and machine readable. So for humans, so they can see like, what is this component doing? Does it fit into my pipeline? Uh, what do I need for it? And then machine readable, so for now can actually do it. So we uh, check, like, is this uh, a fit in the pipeline? Are there any issues with it? Uh, which data do we need to read? And so on. There's a lot of information in there that we use. And then finally, we take care of the heavy lifting, uh, and we use a lot of open source tools and managed platforms for that. So first of all, you can run locally, which is very easy for development. My demo will run locally as well. Um, we, <laughs> yeah, we'll see if it comes back. Um, yeah, yeah, it's turning on. We do this by uh, leveraging Docker Compose. Um, so if you run a local pipeline, it runs on Docker Compose. Um, or you can run on managed cloud. So we currently have uh, yeah, Kubeflow, it's less managed, you can run it anywhere. But you can also just execute for now pipelines on Vertex AI or Amazon SageMaker. Uh, we can scale each step individually. You can define like these are the resources I need, a GPU, this amount of RAM, the, uh, this amount of CPUs. Um, and finally we leverage Dask to do a lot of the uh, yeah, data processing complexity. So you just write your code and we make sure that it uh, works on larger than memory processing. So even if you only have a couple of gigabytes RAM, you need to process terabyte sized data, uh, you can do that. Uh, and you also get parallelization across cores for free. Uh, distributed across machines is again, uh, something on the roadmap, but uh, you can already get some really big machines on the cloud as well, uh, which lets you parallelize a lot. So that's the basics to make it work. And then you can have a look at the uh, hub for components available, plug them into your pipeline, and this way actually build a, a pipeline really quickly. One example of components that we have are components to interact with VV8, uh, which I'll show in the demo. And so to summarize, uh, like our tagline is production ready, data processing made easy and reusable. So production ready, I mentioned like we do a lot of uh, things for you, uh, larger memory data uh, parallelization. You get the data lineage and caching for free. Uh, you can deploy to managed or non-managed platforms. Uh, it's easy to create custom components in Python because like the interface currently uh, uses Pandas. We'll look at uh, uh, providing more options there in the future. But so it's with the tools that you know. Uh, and uh, you can move from local development to remote deployment without any code changes. So again, you can iterate locally to build your pipeline and then just deploy to your remote platform. And shareable, um, yeah, you can create your pipeline quickly with reusable components, but you can also build them once and share them with other people, share them within your team or with the open source community. So that's the framework. Um, now onto the uh, sample use case. So. I mentioned I work at uh, ML6 as well. We're a machine learning consultancy, so we're currently building a lot of REC systems. And one thing that we notice as a problem is that it's very e uh, very hard to tune them. Like setting them up is easy, but actually getting good results is the, the hard thing. And you can also see this screenshot from the uh, Open AI Dev Day where they mentioned like the steps they had to take to get good REC performance. Um, and based on, on our own experiences across projects, we noticed that parameter tuning probably takes up most of the work uh, to set up a REC system currently. So we saw a fit here with some uh, advantages of all now. Um, again, we have a lot of reusable REC components. You can quickly build your pipeline, uh, but they're also very easily parameterizable. <coughs> you can swap in and out components, uh, but you can also uh, provide arguments to each component to change how it works. Um, you have the caching, which lets you quickly iterate, no need to calculate anything again if you already did so. Uh, you can inspect the data through the lineage, uh, and you get the parallel processing and uh, deployment to production. So now onto the demo. It's also a live demo, uh, so uh, let's hope it works as well. 
Uh, I had to make one small adjustment uh, because the internet here is not great. So I ran it beforehand so I can leverage some more caching, but then you can uh, see it. So this is the repo. It's a use case uh, repo. It doesn't have as many stars yet as a, a record reaper one. Um, and two files I want to highlight are the pipeline files, uh, because I want to show how you create a uh, Fonda pipeline. So it's a interface that you might know from different uh, data processing. Bigger. Uh, Control plus. Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, or just I'm gonna. You were right. <laughs> I don't know why it's not. That also works. All right. Um, yeah, it's hard with one hand to do everything. Um, but you might know it from other data processing frameworks. You define a pipeline, and then you can see um, from there on we start applying transformations. So the first one is a load from home face up uh, component. So it's one of our reusable components. We load a data set. You can see like it's a wiki text data set for demo purposes. Of course, you want to uh, switch this out with your own. We have a lot of readers. Uh, you can read the Llama index. You can just read blob storage. You can read uh, a lot of different things. Um, you can define a schema, of course, for a read component uh, that's often needed. And then you can see like uh, we have a component that chunk text, that embed text, uh, that index Reviate, and so on. It's quite easy to build uh, a pipeline this way. We wrapped it into a factory function just so we can parameterize it easily. Uh, I'll import it in a notebook and use it. And this is the evaluation pipeline. It's very much the same uh, with some different components. So looking at the uh, example notebook, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to create this iteration loop with Fonda to load data into VV8 and then evaluate it. We're going to try different parameters and then explore the data. And uh, that will help us decide like uh, which parameters we need to use to get the best result. So we'll do a couple of things. First, set up the VV8 vector store. That's quite easy. Uh, define the parameters to test. Then run the indexing pipeline, uh, run the evaluation pipeline, uh, inspect the data, and repeat. So the first couple of steps are uh, yeah, just some validation that you have all the dependencies set up. They should be done. We have VV8 running with Docker Compose as well. Let's see if we can connect to it. We can. And then we have our indexing pipeline. So I just showed you the code. This is schematic. Um, so we load data uh, now using home face. But again, for rank, you might want to use the uh, Llama index loaders. We chunk the data and embed the, date, the, the chunks. That's actually being uh, uh, used with, with uh, Langchain <coughs> in the component. And then we index the vector store. So I showed you we create like the, the factory function. Here are the arguments that we will pass to it. Um, so it might be a bit uh, small, but these are the, the things we decided we might want to change. The embedding model we're using, um, the, uh, and the, the chunking uh, strategy. I think those are the, the main ones here. So we'll create the pipeline, and then we'll run it. Uh, so you see we're using the Docker runner. You can import the Vertex runner, SageMaker runner, anything you want. Uh, this is done from, I need my both hands for this. Um, so we're using the Python SDK here. Uh, the not so nice thing is that it shows everything in red. Uh, if you use a CLI, which you offer as well, you get very nice scores per component, which shows you the output. Um, and you can see the uh, yeah the components running here. So we're loading the data from home phase. Uh, next one is chunking the uh, documents. And you can actually see like it says chunking 250 documents four times. We're loading 1,000 documents. I'm, uh, I have four cores uh, on Docker Compose, so it's um, using all four of those. And then it's going to embed them. Um, so this is the uh, yeah, embedding model being downloaded. Um, so the second time, this can go a lot faster, uh, being cached. Uh, so if you don't change anything before this step in the pipeline, it will just reuse the result from before. Um, one problem here might be that it uh, takes a bit longer to download the model with uh, the internet here. Uh, but I already explained the next steps as well. So what we'll do after is we load evaluation data. We have a question data set um, that we prepared for the data that we're loading. 
uh, we're going to embed the questions with the same embedding model that we defined for the indexing. And we're going to query the vector store. Um, and then we're going to evaluate it using RAGAS, which is an open source uh, rank evaluation framework. And finally, yeah, an aggregation step to get your results on a pipeline level instead of at a question level. All right, it's continuing. Um, actually, I can show it here as well while we're waiting. Uh, so this is Docker desktop. So you can see here, this is the pipeline running each step. Uh, if you run it on, on Vertex or SageMaker, you get like a nice graph uh, and you can see it progressing. So it's embedding the data. Um, again, you can see like the bars, some are farther ahead than others because it's using the multi-processing again. Nothing had to be implemented to do it. Uh, it comes for free. Um, it indexes VV8 and it's done. So now we can do the same thing with our evaluation pipeline. Um, we're going to run it as well. Uh, let's see. So here, I ran this before um, to save a bit of time. So you can actually, if the output doesn't disappear, you can actually see that it says uh, that it found a previous, let me try it like this. It found a previous execution of a component, so it's not recalculating it again. Um, the only thing that uh, I deactivated is like caching for the reviate retrieval because it's, it's based on a side effect, so we don't want caching from that component. It is uh, retrieving the new data, it is evaluating it, and then finally the pipeline finishes. So let's look at the results. Uh, yeah, I ran a pipeline already before. Um, the uh, only thing is, yeah, it doesn't always load the exact same data, so you can see a bit of a difference here. Uh, it's the same parameters, but it's also uh, because the data loading is, is now cached uh, in the indexing pipeline that it differs. And what we can do now is we can look at the um, data in the Explorer. So this is a UI that comes with uh, Fulma. So here we can see the pipeline we just executed, and you can see the, the data schema at each step. Um, so this is very nice for uh, yeah, inspecting. You can see the indexing pipeline as well. Uh, it's a bit simpler. Uh, you can see the different runs uh, that you did, so I did one before and one now. And then we have a data set explorer where you can see the actual data. So we want to look at our chunking strategy. So here we can see the different chunks that are being generated. Uh, you can have a document viewer here. If you are working with PDFs, as long as a PDF formatting and so on. Um, you can have a look at the evaluation as well. So this is the evaluation data. We actually see like per question, we can see the retrieved chunks on the right and then a score. There's two metrics we're calculating, context precision and context relevancy. Um, you can see that the context relevancy isn't scoring that uh, high. We can see that like it's, it's Wikipedia, there's a lot of information in every sentence. If you look at the uh, chunking data, you can actually see um, that they might contain a lot of information still. So one of the things you could try is to uh, lower the length of your chunks, maybe increase the, uh, the overlap, and then rerun the pipelines and get different results. So I don't know if I still have time to do that. <laughs> um, very quickly, maybe to uh, uh, get started. So what you then do is you change the parameters. So let's say we go for a, a smaller chunk size, a larger overlap. You can easily run it again. So uh, again, the indexing pipeline, oh, wait. I need to uh, stop the execution of the Explorer because it's blocking. So you can rerun it, um, and again, it uh, hopefully goes quite fast. So you can see data loading is being uh, skipped because we loaded it before, uh, but we changed the chunking, so the chunking is being redone. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's gonna embed again and so on, but I think uh, you saw the, the gist of it already had the two pipeline runs. Um, we're working on a, a second version of this, which does the 
uh, parameter search automatically. So this is with the local runner. Next version, you can define like these are the parameter ranges I want to try. Then submit multiple pipelines to uh, Kubeflow, Vertex, or SageMaker, and get an overview of the results of different pipelines all at once. Um, so keep an eye out for that on our uh, repo. Then going back to my slides, uh, the only thing I have left here is a QR code where you can find all the links. Um, so yeah, have a look. <laughs> what do you use again? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, have a look at the Fondar repo, the example repo, uh, join our Discord. We're very uh, uh, much looking forward to, to feedback. I think uh, the message that Bob brought before as well, it's uh, uh, especially important for us because yeah, we want to make data processing shareable. Uh, you can't do that without a community. And so that's what we're here for, of course, as well. If you have any questions, yes? Yeah, well, well, great presentation, thank you. Um, <clears throat> With uh, so many uh, parameters um, available, um, as you start with your data sets, like it can be very overwhelming. Like what to try? Like, I mean, there's an almost infinite uh, amount of options you can tweak, right? So, in what way could like you guys process a lot of data? Um, and is, is there any way to have some handouts? Like you know, because that's a data set that's being recognized as similar to maybe many other data sets that have been going through that before. A system that says, why can you try this? Yeah, uh, I think that would definitely be uh, possible and interesting. I don't think it's the, the aim of Fondant. So the rank demo is a demo to show like the advantages of the framework, the uh, caching, the uh, parallelization, the readiness for production, and so on. Um, so while I think it can be interesting, maybe it's something more for BV8 than for <laughs> Fondant. <laughs> So one of the problems about evaluating RAG pipelines that's currently, I mean, we have saw uh, the example regex, it's an open source library, but one of the problems is that the library is very prone to small change in the prompt, small change in the wording, but the semantic relation would be the same. So um, there are other solutions, but I haven't currently, Leonie from my team is working on these evaluation of RAG pipelines. And we are discussing internally several things, but we are also partnering with the creators of Regas. Um, and there is a collaboration coming up, but I do not want to glimpse it now because it's also related to, to Regas. But watch our social media communication. Leonie, especially, is writing a lot about exactly this topic. Um, there's one good option for you if it's not straight open source, Galileo, so that looks very promising from the outside to evaluate rug pipelines at the moment. Um, but they're also improving stuff coming in RegEx and also Aris from Stanford is also there. Um, but this is more, at, I'm not at the end at this, it's just we're digging currently into it, it's a discussion we had just four days ago so that we saw just, okay, wait a second, um, it's drifting. Um, yeah, that's all what I can say at the moment. <laughs> yes, and I think Ragas is one of the open source uh, alternatives out there now. It's the one we chose because it's accessible. You only need questions. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mentioned you can easily swap out components. So we'll have more evaluation components in the future. Uh, ones that work with ground truth data uh, and so on as well, where you can use other metrics. And so that's one of the, the advantages to highlight. And if uh, you can't find the metrics that you want, you can uh, always build a custom component and contribute it to the hub as well. I missed one thing. <laughs> we have a blog post on VV8 about evaluation from Eric and Connor. I've, re I've read it on my way here. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's not solving no. the problem I mentioned. All right. Yes. yes. I have a question maybe that's it's a basic question, but still, uh, it's regarding to the, meta, uh, the embed models. Uh, for instance, in the case of OpenAI, they discontinued a couple of uh, older embed, uh, embed models. Uh, this could solve it because you can swap the embed model and reprocess yeah. everything in quite yeah, in a matter of seconds, right? Yeah, indeed. So now I use a very small hang face model because I didn't want to have to uh, yeah, access an API the whole time during the the demo, it's easy for everyone to run, which can easily change it. Uh, like you can use uh, any hung face embedding model. You can use the OpenAI API. You can use the Cohere API. Uh, there's a lot of options in that. 
uh, like the, the embedding component is one that we built ourselves to be very general, but even if it doesn't contain an option uh, that, that you need, there might be a different component yeah, that does it. Yeah. So that's the, the whole goal, that interchangeability, um, yeah, using uh, components from other people also to uh, share best practices within your company, uh, to use it across different projects, to only build things once and reuse them. Uh, that's the, the whole goal of Fondant. Yeah. All right, um, maybe I see one final question and then I'm too scared to go on. <laughs> <laughs> Who else is doing this at like scale um, where can you see it going, and how easy could it be? I answer whichever of those is the, the most important. One. Yeah, um, I think uh, like there's a, a couple of companies doing uh, something similar, but not exactly the same. I still think like the the uh, the main one would be Hungface. Like they already have the data sets. Uh, we we're talking with them as well. Like this is something that they would like on their hub as well, like a missing component to uh, be able to share data processing. Um, how easy it can get, uh, I think our goal, our, our vision is to um, be able to practically execute a notebook and have Fonda ex um, uh, execute the code underneath with Fonda components. Uh, so to make it almost as easy as notebook development, you uh, will make it iterative, will add eager execution, so you don't have to define your whole pipeline and run it, that you can like define each component, run it, see the data, um, so really make it as easy as possible, and then at the end, you still have a production-ready pipeline that you can submit, that you can schedule to rerun, that you can monitor, that you can do everything with. Um, so, yeah, the answer is as easy as possible. Um, we have to start from a lot of complexity, like it's in, I would call it, an operations tool at the, the very bottom, and we're constantly building like easier layers on top. So I think uh, uh, we just did a new release yesterday evening, which uh, again brought huge simplifications, um, and every next release will try to do the same, just make it simpler and simpler for users to, uh, to use it, to chain components. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll have Python components soon. Now you still need to uh, create your own Docker component, let's say. Uh, next big block on the roadmap is that you can just define a Python function, and we'll take care of all the uh, running it in a Docker container on our side. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Roba. Uh, so there will be one more speaker, Surab. Hi. Um, I want to make uh, use the time while you are setting up uh, to make one uh, final announcement. This is going to be our last talk, and afterwards we're going to have time to collaborate, to network, and we will have food and drinks um, in the launch. So a little bit more patient, <laughs> patience uh, for the last talk. And I want to make sure if you don't have a raffle ticket yet, we are giving away <laughs> a cool Lego set. So make sure before you go to the drinks, grab your ticket so we uh, will have the raffle at the end. All right? Thank you. And now uh, applause for Sora. Thank you. I'll try to uh, keep it short and to the point. Um, so thanks for your time. Uh, I'm Sorab, one of the co-founders of uh, Orchestra. Uh, something quick. So background in uh, building and running B2B SaaS companies uh, over the last uh, 20 years. And uh, over the last two years, we've been uh, building Orchestra. Throughout the summer, we were also lucky to uh, get our first uh, uh, pre-seed uh, funding round. Is the mic okay, by the way? Or does it go on and off? Oh, yeah. I'll keep it closer. <laughs> um, so I thought I'll zoom out a bit uh, from the, all the technicalities and also uh, share some of our insights and what we see uh, to make the Gen AI project stick in your different organizations. So some teams will be in very tech-savvy organizations where everyone will speak tech, but you will also have to deal with um, non-technical counterparts in the organization and how can you collaborate. Um, so throughout the discussions we've been having over the last couple of months, uh, we s start seeing some patterns in maturity levels of organizations and what they're actually trying to achieve. Also, what we see is if they aspire too high, uh, there's a, a chance that um, there are gonna be friction and uh, things can fail. So uh, throughout the maturity levels, we always see organizations starting with internal knowledge retrieval, also because it's an internal facing use case, low risk, uh, so uh, for, for your image. 
Um, second is we see organizations stripping out chatbots, replacing it with Gen AI uh, replacements. I think it's the connection here. Okay, yeah. Uh, third is uh, when they are re-engineering internal business processes to give little agents and co-pilots to their people in different uh, functions. So marketing, sales, how can we uh, improve their way of working with Gen AI? Fourth is we have our existing products. How can we enrich it with uh, co-pilots and agents for our final users? Of course, very risky. Uh, because it's your users seeing any mistakes and, uh, and errors happening. Then finally they reach, okay, we have all this data, we've already learned our lessons, what more can we do and develop and come up with new business models um, and new business lines in our organization? Um, and it's of course our job to help them through these maturity levels as they grow. So what are some of the challenges uh, what, end-to-end uh, -end product teams when they want uh, to start with generative AI. Uh, one is that uh, the people are stuck in their silos. So you have the engineering teams, but a lot of, for a lot of the use cases, you need to involve your domain experts on the HR side, on the legal side, on the marketing and sales side. Um, and how do we bridge the distance between these two? Uh, second is uh, scarce resources, right? No organization has ever said, we have too many AI engineers sitting around, uh, let's find them something to do. It's always a scarcity. So how can you leverage the people you do have running around uh, to the maximum? And also offload some of their workload to other colleagues. Uh, third is the lack of tooling, right? So everyone has all the DevOps tooling set up in their landscapes um, and running their deterministic software, but how do you manage the higher fireability and all the probabilistic behavior you have when working with uh, Gen AI? Um, and fourth is, uh, while the engineering teams want to manage for stability and predictability of the software, the people involved with Gen AI use cases want to iterate and experiment and move much faster. So how can you move at two different speeds in the organization? And of course, every week, new stuff is being dumped on the teams that everyone wants to work with and leverage. So how can you set yourself up for uh, that adaptability? So um, four principles we recommend to always consider, and I will also show you that how we uh, do that within Orchestra. So um, how you need to make sure you break down the barriers between the different silos of the people. Uh, in the organization, in the different functions and departments. Uh, second is, treat Gen AI as a remote configuration where possible. Of course, you cannot stretch this to the extreme, but how can you look at uh, Gen AI as a configuration? Uh, set up for continuous change and use abstraction layers. Um, so, uh, by breaking down the barriers for cross-collaboration, it's uh, giving the teams more visibility and controls on cost, quality, and performance. Um, involving the domain experts in the teams that requires new types of tooling. Uh, so they uh, cannot work with the very technical tools. So how can you involve them in the workflows, in, um, in reviewing outputs, and doing uh, quality checks? So in our case, um, oh, it's very... Uh, low resolution uh, is the experimentation playground where teams can uh, experiment side by side with their own uh, models that they have, fine-tuned models, private models, uh, where they have real-time visibility in costs and uh, latency of the models um, and iterate just really fast. Also a non-technical person is uh, working and doing prompt engineering here. Uh, treating a Gen AI as a remote configuration. So what we enable is to inject uh, the, the endpoints remotely with a Gen AI. So you totally decouple code changes from uh, the Gen AI upgrades. Uh, and there's independent uh, cycles as they uh, are running these. And it also removes a lot of the spaghetti from the code. A lot of the if else thens you can remove and uh, um, make it in a no code uh, environment. 
So one of the remote configurations we provide is the prompt studio, uh, where the prompt engineers uh, can do their prompt engineering, uh, selecting their primary models, their fallback models, uh, without any code changes. And within a couple of seconds, this will be then uh, pushed to production, and the software does not need any changes and upgrades, and it will just consume the new configs. This also includes function calling. Um, the setting up for continuous changes, the composability in the building blocks you have throughout your application. So not only for your prompts, but of course for your rec um, and other components throughout your landscape. How can you switch them in and out easily uh, without being locked in too much with a specific provider and model? And making rollbacks as cheap and uh, painless as possible. So the cost of failure, the cost of experimentation goes down. In our case, we provide uh, a very flexible business rules engine where based on the context of a specific user or an application, different configurations or endpoints can be called. Uh, this allows the promotion of changes throughout the different environments without code changes, localization and personalization in production. Uh, finally is the use of abstraction layers. Uh, to free up team capacity. So through our generative AI gateway, with a single uh, line of code, you're able to connect to, at this moment, 65 different models. And with the use of the flexible rules engine that I just showed you, you're able to, in real time, switch between models, providers, and experiments. Um, this also frees up a lot of the commodity work the teams need to do. Uh, that they normally need to maintain, so they can focus on the actual use case, cases and the value adds, while they're leveraging the best practices that are, in an opinionated way, ingrained in their workflow. So the total abstraction layer we provide in our case is um, the generative AI gateway, and on top of that, uh, a model garden to manage your public-private models and their configurations, uh, an experimentation playground, a mass experiments uh, connected fully to your prompt engineering workflow and all the needs you have there. As your production systems are consuming these, you will have real-time observability monitoring on every interaction across all the models, which then can be annotated and commented, corrected by real humans that that can be leveraged for fine-tuning through the endpoints of the different models. And this whole cycle, of course, then can start from the beginning, where you can uh, build and improve on top of your fine-tuned models. Um, well, I had a whole demo prepared, but I think also in uh, looking at the time, uh, feel free to uh, scan the QR code for an account, and uh, if there's any questions, I'll see you at the drinks afterwards. Thank you. Questions, by the way? Or everyone wants drinks? Drinks. Ah, there's a one question. Uh, I mean, you mentioned that like, there are different kind of stakeholders involved. And maybe not all of them are equipped with thinner skills to actually uh, make decisions and stuff. So, uh, especially with the AI case and Gen AI in particular, how do you see you know, exchange of these information? Because some of them are not AI engineers. Yeah, by, by providing a no-code interface, uh, also the less technical people can do prompt engineering, analyze the feedback, analyze the metrics, uh, saying, oh, it's too expensive, how can we bring down the cost? The performance is low, how can we move to a faster model maybe? Right, so all of these happens with literally clicks. Um, so, um, the, they'll get it with a couple of uh, hours of onboarding. Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of like the feedback, uh, especially with generative AI, the output for a non-tech guy is simply words, right? Like, okay, this information was not relevant, for example, or it was ambiguous, let's say. Uh, and then how do you translate it back to the technical team, especially, or between the teams? Well, they literally collaborate within Orca, 